Hi guys, welcome back. Today we're going to look at energy generation and storage. So we're going to learn about finite and renewable energy sources and systems that store energy and understand the pros and cons and compare and contrast for each. So let's look at non-renewables first of all. So as we know, it takes a lot of energy to extract materials and, and also transport goods around the globe. So this direct use, so fuels being burned out of trucks and uh, ships, for instance. But energy is also needed to manufacture products and power systems. So this indirect use that we tend to sort of forget about. So here I've included a little video of glass bottles being made because it's a very energy intensive process. So non-renewables are fossil fuels, and these are finite resources. That means that they will be used up eventually. They are, can mainly consist of oil, coal, natural gas, and these are all sourced from underground. So the first video I have for you is all about fossil fuels, and each of these videos, which is about one to three minutes, all from Student Energy, which are excellent. So give this one a watch. So how do we actually get electricity from fossil fuels? Well, what happens is that in power stations, they are burned and that burning produces heat and that heat heats water, which creates steam and that steam drives a turbine, which spins a generator and it's that generator that produces electricity. So the reason that non-renewables are so prevalent is because the infrastructure is in place, right? We've been burning them for many uh, decades, even moving on to hundreds of years. So we have the systems in place to uh, facilitate it. It's also currently reliable and cost effective because extraction and running costs are low. However, they are finite. They will run out, as we mentioned. And this graph shows that we are currently at what's called peak oil. So we've been using a lot of oil as well as other fossil fuels for a long time. And we are about at the tipping point where actually from here on in, oil is going to become more scarce and expensive. There also can be quite polluting at source, not always, but in some cases. So toxic runoff uh, can impact local people and wildlife. So some uh, individuals have got cancer, for instance, from uh, consuming water which is very toxic and it does kill wildlife in um, at source and it can be a real scar on the earth as well like the alberta shale or and of course it is contributing to climate change so when we burn fossil fuels carbon dioxide is released and this is increasing the percentage in the atmosphere intensifying the greenhouse effect right it's like a blanket that is being laid over the earth and it's like we're laying on more and more blankets and the earth is warming up so this is leading to global warming and climate change. So we can already see the results in weather extremes like more recent hurricanes and floods in only the past few years. So for instance, in 2020, there was an Australian bushfire. It burned many millions of, of acres of, uh, of land and destroyed 3,500 homes. And you can see this little koala here trying to uh, latch onto the last of the forest. And unfortunately, a lot of koalas were killed as well as other species. Um, in that devastating fire as well. Um, and of course, it's going to affect a lot of people, right? So people who uh, who live on low-lying areas in particular or in areas where hu hurricanes and floods are common. So thankfully, there really has been a push for renewables. Many people want choices for clean sources of energy. And governments are listening and actually starting to introduce targets to cut down emissions, although to what extent it can be debated. And as renewable technology improves, we can improve it uh, and uh, get more energy more cheaply. So we have improved efficiency and cost. So let's take a look at some renewables. The first is wind power. So turbines are placed in windy spots, not just in land where we tend to see them, but also offshore. And the blades turn a generator inside and this produces electricity. There's other types of wind turbines, not just the horizontal axis, but also vertical axis wind turbines. So the positives is that it's obviously clean energy. It's really good for a windy island nation like the UK, it requires very little maintenance, and the space beneath can be used for agriculture, for instance, grazing sheep. However, it can be quite noisy. It has this low sort of hum, which can affect people if they live close by. Um, some people don't like how they look in the landscape, which is understandable, although that's personal preference. And there have been uh, cases where they do kill wildlife, unfortunately, such as bats and birds, although not very common. 
And now you can take a look at the next video on wind power. So next up we have solar. So photovoltaic cells can generate electrical current directly from the sun's energy. So photo meaning light as in photograph and voltaic as in voltage. And they can come in portable uh, sort of compact versions as well, not just these really large ones. And if you ever see this type on a roof, these are actually vacuum tubes and they have water that runs through them and it, uh, they heat up the water straight to the water tank. So the positives, again, it's clean energy. And they're very versatile and easy to install. So they're made in units in factories and then they can just be installed very straightforwardly. They also require little maintenance and compared to wind, they are silent. However, it is intermittent energy, particularly in a cloudy country or cloudy nation like the UK, and it does use a large surface area. So if it's put out in a field, you can't really graze animals beneath, or if it's out in uh, uh, in the ocean, then it can, it can impact the sort of the fish beneath. And the panels also have to be cleaned, so there's some maintenance there. And to dig a little deeper, you can watch this video on solar. Next, we have hydroelectric. So this generates energy from moving water. So a dam is built uh, where there is a river that was previously flowing and the uh, area behind the valley is flooded behind to create a reservoir at the top and at the bottom. So the top reservoir moves downhill under uh, gravity, obviously, and it rotates the turbines which are connected to generators. This is sounding very familiar. It can also be used as a kinetic storage pump, so kinetic meaning movement energy. So the lower reservoir is actually pumped back up into the top reservoir, and they do that at night time, because when people are asleep and not at work, the energy demand locally is very, very low. So they use some of that excess energy and they actually pump it back up. And this also allows for the monitor of peak demand and steady delivery. So the pros, again, it's clean energy and it's reliable and very much built to last. However, it is expensive to set up and it is currently debated whether or not the, uh, how the, what the impact is on the valley behind. So hydroelectric can probably be most complicated out of our choices, so definitely worth a watch this time. We also have Tidal Barrage, which has some uh, shares some similarities with hydroelectric in that it also generates energy from moving water, but this time it's tidal water. So a smaller dam is built across an estuary, it's like a river, and these also have turbines inside them that then spin generators that produce electricity. So the positives, they can also be used as roads, so they can actually be built into the infrastructure, and that it's predictable energy, right? It happens pretty much all the time. However, they can also be fairly expensive to set up and they can limit the movement of wildlife. The next video from Student Energy uh, actually c covers the variety of different types of uh, wave energy, wave power. So you can just focus on tidal barrage unless you would like to watch the rest of the video. Now we also have biomass. So this is where plant materials are burned in place of fossil fuels. So otherwise, the um, outcome is pretty much the same. So power stations burn them to produce heat, to heat water, to produce steam, drive a turbine and spin a generator. Now plants can be grown specifically for this purpose or waste materials from such as wood felling are burned instead. And the idea is that it's, it has a net zero emission. So if you are growing an area of land with crops or trees, and they are taking in carbon dioxide as they grow because they are plants. Um, but when they are cut down and they're burned, they actually give it out again. But at least this way, it's net zero. So it's taking in as much as it's giving out in theory. And there's also biofuels like biodiesel, which are becoming common for direct use. So the positives are very much like fossil fuels in that the infrastructure is in place and it's reliable, but it can also use waste material from other processes and it has the potential to extract more carbon than is released. If these companies have a mind to do so, they can plant, for instance, two trees for every one that they might cut down. However, it is energy intensive farming and some countries, unfortunately, are devastating local habitats to grow these biofuel crops. So for instance, sugarcane and palm oil are being grown in place of the Amazon rainforests, which is being cut down to do so. And the next video goes into much more detail about it, so give it a watch. 
Now let's take a look at our alternative energy, which is nuclear. So depending on who you talk to, some people will say that it is finite and some people will say that it is a renewable source. So let's look at why. So it works in a very similar way to fossil fuels in that water creates steam to drive a turbine to drive a generator. But in this case, the difference is that it's using a nuclear material, a nuclear fission, such as uranium rods, which get incredibly hot and that's what heats the water. So rather than burning fossil fuels. So the positives is that it's also fairly clean energy with low levels of CO2. It's reliable and cheap. However, the fuel sources are finite by definition. It's also expensive to build, maintain and decommission. That means take it down at the end of its lifetime. And of course, there is a serious risk of the dangerous radioactive waste and how it is managed after it's been uh, used up and how it's stored for our future generations as well. And although it is small, there is a risk of nuclear disasters such as Fukushima. So watch this video and get a little more informed. Now I thought it'd be good to have a little look at world usage. So here we have a world map and this excellent uh, website which I'd like you to go to and we're going to uh, compare and contrast some different countries. So although this map is a little out of date because it's 2014 data, if we look for instance at the UK, you can see here that it comes up and we're currently at 30% coal use. 30% uh, natural gas, 19% nuclear, and only a very fraction, 17 and 1% of renewable energies. It's quite comparable with the US, for instance, um, but if we look, for instance, at one of our neighbours, Finland, you can see there's such a difference, massive nuclear and a lot of hydroelectric and renewables. So I'd like you to have a little browse around. I think you'd be really interested. So before we go, we just need to cover energy storage nice and quickly. So, of course, that's going to be mostly in the form of batteries. So batteries store chemical energy to create electrical voltage and are used for portable devices. We have two main types, alkaline and rechargeable batteries. So alkaline batteries are the ones we tend to think about, sort of double A's, triple A's. So for toys, remote controls, for instance, and uh, the power gradually decreases until they um, have to be disposed of, but they are recyclable. Rechargeable batteries, such as lithium ion batteries, can be recharged by reversing the chemical reactions inside. They have long lifetimes, so they're more environmentally friendly. They are more expensive, but because they last so long, they're sort of cheaper overall. So these are the kinds you might be familiar with at home. But also remember things like uh, camera batteries, mobile phone batteries, and the list goes on. And things like electric cars, right, and electric buses with their huge battery storage uh, on board. So we went through a lot today, guys, but well done for keeping up. So we, what we learned was finite fossil fuels come from coal, oil and gas. They are a reliable source of energy for the current infrastructure, but are contributing to the greenhouse effect and climate change. So really, we want to be focusing on renewables in the future, such as wind, solar, hydroelectric, tidal barrage and biomass, which are clean sources of energy. They do have some downsides, however, which uh, focuses a lot on cost. Um, which means that not all countries use them all that regularly, including ourselves. Nuclear power is reliable and economical, but it obviously carries some risks. And energy can be stormed, uh, stored in the form of batteries and kinetic storage pumps as well. Well done, guys, for keeping up, and I will see you in class. Bye.